welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. Our program promotes progressive, populist perspectives on the issues of the day. The Alliance for Democracy is dedicated to establishing true democracy and creating a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Our guest today is Dana Carsonson, a candidate for Metro Council in the 4th District. Please note that because a candidate is on our program, that does not mean that the Alliance for Democracy either supports or endorses that candidate. So welcome to our program. Thank you for having me. Right, yeah, so talk about Metro. What is Metro? Uh, Metro is a regional planning agency that encompasses 24 different cities and three counties in the Portland metropolitan area. Uh, their job is to uh, create dialogue with the local governments to handle regional concerns, such as the urban growth boundary, waste management, uh, parks, um, even the Oregon Zoo, the Convention Center, and the Portland Expo Center. Mm -hmm. So whatever a, a regional concern is that they, uh, they think is a regional concern or whatever the state of Oregon thinks is a regional concern, it is up to Metro to create a 50-year plan and a roadmap to handle that regional concern. Okay, so while most people don't know what Metro is and probably have never heard of it yeah. and probably don't vote for Metro commissioners or counselors, yeah. um, it's a really important. It, it is extremely important. It's it, they, they are the ones that map out the 50-year guideline of how our region is going to grow. They, um, like I said, it, 24 different cities, three counties, and 1.8 million people. And we're growing at 1,000 people net a week, mm -hmm. you know, 1.75%. And so where are we going to expand that, you know, urban growth boundary? That's Metro. How are we going to handle 1.4 million U.S. tons of trash every year, that's up to Metro. Um, you know, conservation efforts uh, when it comes to the region through the Oregon Zoo, that's up to Metro. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they have a lot of power, it's just people don't realize they're there, unfortunately. Right, mm -hmm. okay, all right. And they have four districts or five districts or six districts? Or? Uh, they have six districts and an at-large seat. So there's a total of uh, six councilors and one president seat. Okay, and is the president elected separate, or, or who determines the president? Do, do we? Uh, it is yes. It all positions are elected. Uh, the president's seat is also elected. Okay. So right, great. Okay. So uh, you've decided to throw your hat into the ring. Yes, I have. Uh, and uh, tell us, number one, who who presently has the seat, mm -hmm. uh, and why you decided to run. Uh, well, who pr presently has the seat is Catherine Harrington. Uh, she is termed out, so she's served four ter or th sorry three terms, uh, four years each, so about 12 years she's served. Mm -hmm. um, why I'm running, um, I originally went to University of Oregon and I have my degree in planning public policy, and after I graduated there, I got a job at the Oregon Zoo to get my foot in the door uh, with Metro uh, to become a planner, internal hiring purposes. And then I quickly got involved with um, labor activity uh, through my union there. And, you know, bargaining and labor conflicts. And I saw the internal issues with Metro. And over the years, I've had, my, you know, uh, interesting conversations with them, you know, disagreements. And I see a, a need to improve their internal structure. And I see a need for them to actually have a leader in the issues. Um, and now that Catherine is termed out and I have a degree in planning, I want to put my name in the hat uh, because Metro has so much power, but no one, because no one knows about it, uh, no one of leadership goes for it. Mm -hmm. Or if they do, they only use Metro as a political stepping stone for grander political uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't have the passion for planning that I have. I didn't, I didn't spend $40,000 on a college <laughs> degree uh, just because. I spent it because I have a passion for it. So mm -hmm. I, I see a job that needs doing, and I want to do it. Yeah, so. okay. All right, $40,000. Yeah. At compounding interest. Uh, Thank yeah. you, government. All <laughs> right, yeah. Wow. Okay, well, I, I won't tell you how much I spent to get my degree. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't anywhere close to that. <laughs> right. Yeah, a anyway. Uh, so... Y you have identified, I, th I think, three major focuses of mm -hmm. where you want to see changes yeah. 
Okay, so uh, talk about the fiscal responsibility part of it. Uh, fiscal, the fiscal responsibility, uh, there are programs we can institute at Metro uh, that I think we can uh, save taxpayers money um, through cost-benefit analysis and through um, investing in programs that can save taxpayers money. One would be through TriMet. Um, it, it costs twice as much to purchase an electric bus, but over the lifespan you can save $122,000. That's all taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. So we can save, the, we can be fiscally responsible by investing in what will pay for itself. Um, and that's not even including the healthcare benefits of not using a diesel bus anymore. We can save $122,000 in the lifespan of a bus 12 years, use that funds to increase service in Washington County, which is desperately needed and wanted. Um, we could even look into creating a more progressive tax system. Uh, Metro you know, takes in some uh, property taxes. I think we can do a better, uh, create a better tax system than that, a more progressive one. In my opinion, property taxes are regressive. If my mom wants to put on a new roof and that increases the value of the house, she's going to get taxed on that, even though she makes about $35,000 a year now because she's retired. That's regressive. I think we can do a better job. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think there are investments Metro can go for that can save taxpayers money. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, talking about TriMet, TriMet, of course, is a totally different agency yes. from, from Metro. Mm -hmm. and as far as I know, Metro doesn't have any ability to dictate to TriMet no. uh, about buses no. or, or anything no. else. So uh, how, how would that work? So under Metro's charter, one of their goals is to create a um, affordable and safe access to all forms of transportation. That would include TriMet. Uh. If Metro wanted to, and it would only take four votes, Metro could take over TriMet. I'm not suggesting it, but they work very closely with Metro. So, or with TriMet rather, they work very closely together. Mm -hmm. So if Metro wanted to, because it is in their bylaws, in their charter to improve transportation options for everyone, it's, to, it's in, within the well, realm of reason to uh, help fund uh, electric buses so that TriMet can use them. Okay, so so Metro could be a funding agency. Yeah, absolutely. For TriMet. Yeah. Right. Okay. And actually, uh, TriMet and Metro probably are getting a lot of mutual funds as as it is already. As it is already. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, those are the, that's an interesting idea. So, doing that, you help clean up the air. Yep. Uh, you create uh, additional demand for electrified vehicles. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, what are the other benefits? Uh, well, if if we purchase five electric buses every month for 16 years, by 2035, we'd have a thousand electric buses. Uh -huh. That would actually match the growth of our region, which is about 1.75%. Mm -hmm. um, we currently have 700 diesel buses, so if you match that growth, by 2035, we can have a thousand. Oh, yeah. So a thousand electric buses running around uh, the region. Uh -huh. um, giving services that are wanted and needed. Excellent. Well, you, you know, I, I, I'm totally intrigued mm -hmm. by this because I, I don't usually regard Metro uh, Council candidates or the commissioners themselves as being very visionary, mm -hmm. but this is a visionary thing. Thank you. Well, right, yeah, so that, 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 that's good. Yeah. What other visions you got? Uh, one of my passions um, is waste management. I don't know why, but it's always just intrigued my fancy. Um, and it's under Metro's purview. Um, the region produces 1.4 million U.S. tons of trash every single year. Uh, that's minus uh, food, uh, glass, and metal. Everything gets dumped into a landfill. We oh. truck about 300 miles round trip to dump it and just truck and dump. Um, and anybody who's seen a dump truck knows that can't be cheap. And it isn't cheap. And we do that, th and we've been doing that through a 20 year contract with Waste Management Corporation, mm -hmm. a monopoly. Um, if it's a monopoly, we can't have a competitive bidding price. And that contract is up. And unfortunately, Metro is just going to renew or throw a bidding process. And Waste Management, since they are the regional monopoly, 
probably going to win it again. Okay. I would like to see a, a waste of energy program created. And that's an, if you look at Scandinavian numbers, that amount of trash is enough energy, has enough embedded energy to produce almost 20% of our region's energy needs, 15 to 20%. Wow. That is massive potential. Um, and quite honestly, we would probably save money on that too because we're not paying monopoly pricing to just truck it and dump it. Okay, is, so talk about what that means, waste to energy. Yeah. How, how does that happen? So you take all the waste and you can put it through an incineration process, which is the most typical. You just, you burn it and mm -hmm. you capture that heat and you turn it, uh, that heat into energy. I would like to use a form called pyrolysis. It's how charcoal's made. You just mm -hmm. heat something in the absence of oxygen and it just turns into carbon. Um, you capture that heat and that uh, natural gas that re is released and you can turn that into um, energy through combustion. But because it produces carbon, charcoal, you can put it into uh, agricultural fields and you sequester carbon. So in itself, it's carbon negative. It's reversing mm -hmm. climate change, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, and it's also producing cheap energy. We're, th you know, we're throwing all that embedded energy into a landfill, which by the way produces ma massive amounts of methane. 15% of all the methane that goes into the atmosphere is from landfills. Yeah. Um, so we can you know, prevent that, capture all that embedded energy from the trash, and have that carbon, that charcoal, and put it into agricultural fields so we're reversing climate change. On top of not paying a monopoly, monopoly pricing. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, wow. Okay, another so, great idea. Yeah, we're, I mean, that we're talking yeah. about Hmm? Is this being done? No, no, it is not being done. Um, I, I know it's not being done here. Oh, here. Right. Is yeah. it being done elsewhere in the United States, elsewhere in the world? Uh, there are some incineration sites in the United States. Uh, pyrolysis, not, none to my knowledge in the United States. Uh, some in Europe, though. I mm -hmm. have talked to the lead scientist of the USDA, um, who is leading investigation of, uh, with the form of pyrolysis with agricultural waste. Mm -hmm. And he said the great thing about pyrolysis, it's agnostic to the feedstock. So you can put whatever you want into it and it'll work. Oh, okay. So I have a, you know, a federal government employee, the lead person on it says, yep, it'll work well, just fine. Okay. I any cost estimates on, on, on actually building the plant? And I, you know, a I estimate at least a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, we're talking about supplying 15 to 20 percent of the region's energy needs, uh, lowering our carbon footprint, which mm -hmm. definitely has um, economic impacts as we're seeing day to day now. And we're talking about th not hundreds, but probably thousands of jobs, um, good construction trade jobs to build it, and then staff jobs, uh, you know, middle class benefited staffing jobs to run it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Um. As you were talking, a thought went through my mind, and it went right through, unfortunately. Um, well, if it comes back, you can ask. Okay, good. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> right, yeah. So the other, the other uh, area of concern, w well, this general thing about uh, ur urban-rural balance, what, 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 what do you mean by that? Well, we, so with, also with Metro, you have urban reserves and rural reserves. Uh, the Willamette Valley has some of the best you know, uh, farmland in the country. So, so when you say reserves, what, what does that mean? Reserves of what? Ah, good, good, good question. We reserve. They're fifty-year reserves. So when we open up the urban growth boundary to expand the urban area to build new, whatever, new housing, new uh, industrial lots, uh, whatever is needed, um, we take that from the reserves. We take that, it, that you know, say uh, industrial or um, residential would be taken from the urban reserves. Rural reserves are stay, you know, kept for green space essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to keep balance. We have to, you know, Oregon is very much an agricultural state, um, and we have to respect that green space. Um, otherwise, we have we run the risk of just sprawl. Look at any other major city, you know, Dallas, L.A. They're just completely sprawled out because they didn't have that check and balance of a urban growth boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there has been some talk recently about the uh, 
responsibility of the urban growth boundary for the uh, odd affordable housing mm -hmm. prices. Yeah. Comment? Yeah, you know, it, it's a fact that if you limit something, you know, if you limit the space, it's going to increase the cost. And no doubt, it, ha it has increased the cost of housing. Mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. I, you know, I also have an idea to improve um, and create affordable housing. Um, you know, Metro is running the Metro is considering a construction excise tax um, to fund affordable housing. I'm afraid that they're going to repeat the mistakes of the '60s of just destroying, you know, specific areas and building low-income housing blocks. You can't just give someone a cheap space to sleep. That's, it's not going to solve the issue. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is you have to give someone a home, you have to give them ownership over it, and you have to give them uh, access to democracy. And what I would like to see is a community land trust created. Uh, so a community land trust is literally a, say a nonprofit that owns the land and then they can keep that value down. And so if someone wants to buy a house in an affordable manner, they can purchase the house on top of that land. Mm -hmm. And it forever stays in that trust. And that trust is controlled by the homeowners and different community members. So it has a dem democratic control over it. So you don't have to worry about um, developers or millionaires and billionaires or corporations just buying up all the land like they're doing now and inflating the prices to right. unreasonable right. You know. be, be, because, because when we see all the rising home prices it's not actually that the houses cost more no. it's that the land has appreciated in value value right yeah okay. and i think artificially so too mm -hmm. you know you have people just gobbling up all this you know property and it's artificially inflating the prices eventually it's going to come crashing down mm -hmm. uh, community land trust would be democratically controlled create permanent uh, stability, quite honestly, and permanent affordability, um, and it gives people ownership, and it be they become part of that community at mm -hmm. that point. Right. So they they jointly jointly own the land without individually owning the land. They they jointly control the land. Control the land. The okay. trust owns the land, mm -hmm. but they control it through the board. But they themselves would own the property on the land. Yeah, so okay. if they want to sell the house, they totally could. Uh -huh, okay. But the trust would keep the land value more affordable, so others can be able to afford to purchase it. Okay. All right. A and, and Metro's role in doing this is they could they could con create these kind of community land trusts. Metro. What Metro could do is they could create a tax policy that funds um, the land trust. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And then that community land trust could use those funds to purchase properties where the opportunity arises. Uh, Denver, in Denver, they're doing this uh, similar idea. They'll be uh, creating 700 homes in the next five years. I don't think that's enough, obviously. Uh, yeah, that's but immediately. <laughs> yeah, not right. nearly enough. But they're doing that based on fundraising, some grants, and maybe a little bit of government help. Mm -hmm. Metro is a regional government with 1.8 million people. If we create a tax system that specifically funds this, um, and it would create them create a lot more opportunity to, to do the purchasing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about purchasing small houses, but you could purchase um, apartment buildings as well, mm -hmm. and give people ownership over that through uh, limited equity cooperatives. Mm -hmm. you know, again, okay. democratic right; they own it, they control it. Uh -huh. um, empowers people. You just can't give someone a cheap place to sleep. It just doesn't work. Uh, yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, because there are, well, we see a lot of people finding cheap places to sleep on the streets themselves. Exactly. Right, and yeah. that, that can't happen. Th they need a home. Yes. That's the thing. Yes, right, yeah. What, 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 other, what other things that Metro is responsible for or could be responsible for do you think that they need to change how they do, how they do business? Um, well, I mentioned earlier, I've been dealing with Metro internally for five years. I'm very much a pro-union person, done union bargaining, my union shop steward badge right there. Oh, yes. Well, well in fact, I, I first met you at, uh, at uh, Portland Jobs with Justice yeah. meetings, right? Yeah. Yep, right. yes, you did. Mm -hmm. um, I think Metro can improve their labor practices. I think one of the uh, opportunities with governments is they employ so many people, we can use governments to raise the bar. 
uh, across both public and private and third sector, which is nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. So one thing I think is uh, exciting is that uh, AFSCME 3580 um, proposed an idea to create paid uh, parental leave, FMLA, six weeks uh, for all Metro employees, not just the union members, all Metro employees, all regular benefit employees. Uh, and for six weeks to do that, it would be $150,000. That's nothing. Mm. You know, Metro is a $500 million entity, $150,000 to start parental leave for someone. Okay. I want to see, FMLA is 12 weeks. I think we can do 300000 oh, okay. And you create a ripple effect as an employer. Mm -hmm. 1,600 employees now have paid parental leaves, 12 weeks of it. Well, then then you know, maybe someone else does it over there. And then another one says, oh, these two people did it. I should do it too. Then you have three people. Mm -hmm. And then you have six. And then you have 12. You know, that's how we raised the minimum wage at Oregon through government employers. That's how we created uh, paid sick days in Oregon is through government employers. That's how we started, you know, uh, fair scheduling is through government employers. It creates a ripple effect. It creates a domino effect. Mm -hmm. uh, Metro has 1,600 employees. That's, you know, we can create ripples through the labor force of mm -hmm. all of Oregon. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, mm -hmm. So we've, we've got five minutes left, mm -hmm. and so is there is there something that we haven't covered? Um, oh, I, I, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I read this on, on your website mm -hmm. or, or uh, somewhere, uh, that Metro uh, employs a lot of workers on a temporary basis. Yes. Yes. So I, I myself am a Metro employee. I've been a Metro employee since 2013 when I got hired on as a temp uh, employee at the Oregon Zoo. Uh, Metro employs hundreds of temporary workers um, to avoid benefits. Uh, these workers are, oh, I mean, uh, they range from hazardous waste technicians to food workers to admission workers at the zoo to even some animal keepers, quite honestly. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, and I've met people who have been temp for pushing 20 years. They work every, every year, you know, every month, they, they have hours, they, that's not temporary. Mm -hmm. um, we need to solve that. You know, in 2013, uh, right before the Affordable Care Act came to be, they were having Oregon Zoo employees work 1,040 uh, non-union positions and 1,040 union positions, working with the same people, same department, mm -hmm. you know, same cohort, um, but they were working near full time um, throughout the year, but yeah. considered temp. Mm -hmm. But when the Affordable Care Act came along, you started to have to track hours via social security number, not job code. Oh. So what they did is said, oops, this is a big mistake. We should have never been doing this. Uh -huh. Everybody has one pool of 1,040 metro, uh, you know, metro wide, mm -hmm. cutting people's hours in half essentially uh, to avoid health care benefits. Wow. Uh, I, you can find me somewhere on their Metro website under public testimony on video calling them morally and ethically bankrupt for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it's true. Um, unfortunately, they're just looking at dollar and cents yeah. and not the humanity of it. Uh, yeah, and, and it's really upsetting that this I is really such an important issue. Mm -hmm. These decisions have been made. Nobody knows. No one knows. No one knows. No one knows. No, and so I, I really thank you for running. Thank, thank you. It, you know, if, if yeah. for no other reason than just to be able to say that in a larger venue and draw some attention to it. But the other things right. that you've talked about are really uh, creative and forward thinking and things that we should be looking at doing. I'm excited. You yeah. know, even if, even if it doesn't work out for me, it gets people talking. Yes. And unless they're, if they're not talking, nothing gets done. If they're talking, there's a possibility of something getting done. Right. Yeah. A a absolutely. Yeah. 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 The things that don't get talked about don't get addressed. Exactly. And we particularly notice that right now yeah. with the Me Too. Yeah. Uh, with uh, with uh, all this sexual harassment. Exactly. And it's like, yeah. Things are getting done now that people are talking about it. Yeah. Talking so. is really important. It is. Right. Yeah. So we have uh, a minute for you to make a campaign statement. One minute to make a campaign statement. My name is Dana Carstensen. I'm running for Oregon Metro District 4. If you'd like to help me create a system where in our region, our metro region, we can create a waste to energy system instead of trucking and dumping, we electrify our TriMet system, and we create home ownership that is democratically controlled and affordable, 
please go to danacarstensen.com or email me at dana.carstensen at danacarstensen.com. Thank you so much. Great. And thank you for being on the program. Thank you. All right, good. So we've been talking with Dana Carstensen, candidate for Metro Council District 4. He will be on the ballot in May of 2018. District 4 is the westernmost district of the Portland, uh, of the metro area here in, in the Portland area of Oregon. So if you've missed one of our programs, want to watch another one again or suggest a friend do so, you can do all of that as all our Populist Dialogue programs are saved to our webpage. Visit populistdialogues.org to view past programs or when viewing a program, sign up for our YouTube Populist Dialogues channel to receive notification when a new program is added. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.